there was this wealthy man who uh, found out he only had like weeks left to live. And uh, he was trying to put all of his affairs in order and you know, his family gathered around and um, he started divvying up all of his possessions and things he had in life. You know, one, one child of, of his children was going to get their house. The other one got his car collection. And, um, you know, he's trying to split up everything to equal values. Two, his two younger children that were interested in his business, they're going to split his business and, and continue to run that. And, um, but the children asked, but, but dad, what about all the gold that's in the safe? Like, What's going on with all that gold? And he said, well, I worked really hard to earn that. That's going with me. Right? He's, like, I, he's like, I want to be buried with my gold. Right? So, you know, a few weeks later, a month later, the funeral's um, finished up, and, you know, the family loads the gold into the casket. They say goodbye to the gold and to their dad, um, you know, and uh, lowered him into the ground. And now that man, you know, he arrived at heaven, and uh, you know, he believed in Jesus. He, he thought he was his Lord and Savior. And he, he gets to the gate, and he's carrying this uh, rolling suitcase, you know, full of gold. And uh, Peter, Peter looked at him and was like, what's in the suitcase, man? Um, he was like, well, I, I, something, it's just something I spent my whole life working towards. And I really want to bring it into heaven with me. And Peter's like, just show me what's inside the suitcase. You know, they don't got security systems like that at Heaven's Gates. Uh, so, so he's like, all right. So he, he opens it up, and Peter peeks in, and and uh, Peter chuckles. He's like, oh, you might, were you a construction worker on earth? And the guy gets off. No, I was a, a prestigious business owner. I built this business su- successfully from the ground up. And I've earned quite a name for myself and my family, let alone all this gold I accumulated. Why would you ask me that? And Peter replied, well, I thought since you bought along paving materials, you were, you know, handy at that and wanted to help out. <laughs> Isn't it crazy that one of the most valuable things on earth is just paving material in heaven. Like gold is what defines almost the value of everything. Yeah, it's this common thing that things get spilt upon, we walk upon in heaven. We're in our, our sermies, 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 uh, series, Sermon on the Mount. Uh, where we are looking at the first major message that Jesus preached. His message overall, as we, we started two weeks ago, we looked at the Beatitudes in, in that first chapter of Matthew 5 of the Sermon on the Mount and how he was establishing that the kingdom of heaven does not match up with the kingdom on earth. And so he, uh, he's establishing this new value system, these new rules, these new requirements of the kingdom of God. And it's interesting because you can see in the same very fact right here that our value system here on earth is based off of something that, that is nothing in heaven. And so we're starting today, Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, if you want to follow along in your Bible. Um, that's where we'll be for the majority of today. Um, that's in the New Testament, the second half of the Bible, start of it, Matthew. And uh, you, you may have noticed when you opened to that that we, we skipped over the Lord's Prayer. And I just want to let you know that we will come back to the Lord's Prayer. We believe in prayer here, okay? And uh, so, so we'll be back to that and giving it some more adequate time. But today, Matthew 6, verse 19, it says, Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store up your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Because wherever your treasure is, there is the desires of your heart. There the desires of your heart will also be. Now, you, you talk to most Christians, and you talk about what, what are the things you treasure, right? What are the things that you value in life? And um, I think, you know, that they would be honest in their evaluation of their life and say that they value God as one of the number one things, and then probably their family and their friends. And then somewhere underneath that would be work and, and hobbies and all the, the other things that you would treasure and value in life. And we've talked about this here before, um, but if you really want to know what people value, you you can't just listen to what they say, because a lot of times our values don't match up with what comes out of our mouth. And um, so today, while I'm speaking, I want you to not just think, like, that's how I value things. Consider how your actions, consider how your life lines up with that. Um, There's studies show that if you look at these two main things, that you, you can see and understand kind of really where your values play out. And the first thing is your schedule. And when you look at your schedule, you'll be able to see what you value. 
right? Because wherever your treasure is, the desires of your heart will be also, right? And so one of the most valuable treasures we have is our time, right? It, it is probably the most valuable thing we have on earth. Right? I think one of the rewards of heaven is that we have unlimited time, that we exist outside of time. It's the only resource we have that's uh, limited, it's unknown, right? You can try to do whatever you want to extend it, but it really doesn't promise anything. And people guard what they treasure. Right? The things that you treasure most, the things you care about most, that's what you're, you're going to guard and you're going to make sure is safe. And so when we look at time, it's the things that we purposefully make time for in our calendar become the things that we're, we value the most, And so I want you to consider, does your daily routine give room for God? Do you make time for church, or do you just come when it fits? If you really treasured God, if he really is the number one value, don't you think you would involve him much more in your life than an hour or two on Sundays? That's about 1% of your week that you're giving to God. If you said you valued your family and you said, I can tell that because I give them 1% of my time, um... I'd be like, mm. you know, like that doesn't quite line up with what you're saying, right? Nobody would believe you, right? And so that comes out to reality is 14 minutes a day with God. All right, so, you know, in your week, you got you know, roughly a 40-hour work week. Most of us work a full-time job, and you, that's about 25% of your week. You probably spend another 25% sleeping. Um, I'm not asking you to give that up, all right? Okay, don't, don't get any worried here, right? You know? We need sleep. It's a part of how God created us. But you have roughly 50% of your time that you get to choose how to fit it in. And even work is a little bit adjustable or should be. Did you know that your iPhone keeps track of the amount of time you spend on your screen? Have you guys ever opened that and been just disappointed with yourself? Um, <laughs> right? I assume Android has something similar because um, they're always copying Apple. But... Um, and, uh, sometimes, man, when that first came out, it, you know, and for what, the, the week that it is set on, it's like Sunday mornings it would notify me of my average screen time. So, you know, like right before I come up this week, it's like you spent so many ridiculous amount of hours on your phone this past week. One thing that does bother me is that it includes maps, like directions. So, like, you go on, like, a long road trip. It's like you, you average 20 hours a day on your phone. And I was like, I was just trying not to get lost. But... I mean, it's kind of, it's interesting if you look at that. Because in reality, it shows you what you're valuing. Right? How many of you guys use the Bible app on your phone for your devotion time? Right? So it's in there. Is it the highest used app on your phone? Right? Like, I mean, just look at that and go, okay, God, like, what are you trying to speak to me right now? Uh, Man, how much time do you guys spend scrolling social media? Do you spend more than 14 minutes a day scrolling social media, watching TikToks and Reels? What about watching TV? Do you know that if you just average out your week to two and a half hours of TV a day, that's 10% of your week. Right? And that, you know, with uh, Netflix binging, two and a half hours goes real quick. Um, Imagine what your life would look like if you spent 10% of your week on God's things. Right? If God is something you highly value, he should be your number one, and it should be reflected in your calendar. And if you're just sitting there kind of justifying yourself, because I find myself justifying myself here, um, I heard this, uh, someone else say it, I'm going to say it to you, and it's going to probably hit a little bit hard, because it does to me. It says, you should probably stop making excuses and start making adjustments. And like, man, like, Oh, you know, nobody likes hearing that. I will say that when you prioritize your family, when you're pri- prioritizing your, your friends and, and people in general in your schedule, that that honors God. And that can be included in that percentage of God stuff. Even taking care of yourself, because I believe that God expects us to care for ourselves, as he said, love your neighbors as yourself. And so if you're not loving yourself, you are not able to love fully other people. That's right, it's the reason he commanded Sabbath and a rest day. But you can't just do all the things for God and never spend time with God. Right? That, that matters most. Right? And I want to be really honest that this is a struggle for me. Um, th- this idea of scheduling my time, and I, I am an anti-routine person. 
I, I hate schedules, when some, especially when there's like, I look at my calendar, it's all scheduled out for the week, I just get depressed. Because um, I'm just like, where's the room for fun and activities, you know? And um, part of that's my, I'm an Enneagram 7, which means that in general, I just have major FOMO about life. Um, I just get to miss out on everything. If I have things scheduled, if I have to like, you know, do things like, I just want to be able to be free to experience whatever is coming to me. Right? I'm, I'm pretty quick to even give up sleep to not miss things or to squeeze as much stuff into a day that I can. Um, but then that lessens the quality of time that I give to things. Right? I, I'm a fairly high capacity person from a young age. My dad encouraged us to be hard workers and to do as much as you can. And working hard is valuable. And um, I have a hard time limiting myself to schedules and to, to a, a work-life balance that God created for me. Right? Um, I don't know, most of you guys know that I'm full-time here, and so I, I put in a lot of hours here, but I put in a lot more hours than full-time fairly often because I believe that, first off, I need to set the example of asking you guys to be serving the church. I need to be serving the church above and beyond my regular work time as well. But it also could suck away my whole life and finding that balance to, to be with my family and to do other things. You know, I'm not getting paid overtime. I'm not getting hourly wage for the extra work that I put in here. Right? I don't include my personal devotion life in my schedule of church because I ask you guys to do the same and that wouldn't be right. And I'm not saying these things to brag. I'm saying I struggle to prioritize things correctly. Right? And so I know that I'm not alone in this. But I find moments in my life where I do have good balance. Um, at the beginning of this year, I took a, a few days as a Sabbath retreat to just kind of like reset my life and uh, spend some time with God. And one of the main things that God was speaking to me was that I was not prioritizing my time correctly. And I needed to be more intentional with it. Um, when I came back, I, I removed all social media from my phone. I turned off pretty much every notification from um, any just regular apps out there to keep me off my phone. And my screen time average has gone down considerable, like hours a day average gone down. Um, having like do not disturb things on there and learning to leave unfinished projects for another day, right? So, to balance and prioritize God. One of the big things that I'm doing is I, I, I've set my alarm earlier and I get up every morning and I spend more time with God to make sure that he's getting the, the adequate chunk of my life because he is my first priority. And, you know, I, I'll be honest, I haven't always been great at that. Again, partly because I'm not good at schedules and routines. And um, I want to spend time with God, but then having it on a schedule is just like, I don't know about this, God. Right? We prioritize family time. We've, uh, we try our best to do 24 hours with no screens and no electronics in our house to spend time as a family. Um, and we are not perfect at it. I would say we've maybe hit our goal 50% of the time this year, but 50% was better than the 0% that we were doing before. And I believe that God implemented and commanded a Sabbath as very important things. It's one of our main values that we preach in becoming and looking to live a life that looks like Jesus. Um, I think the main reason is that God wants us to know that he is the provider for our life and not us. That one more day of work is not going to add any more value to our life, but reality is of taking a day off of work and, and sitting back and resting and enjoying the life that, that God has given me gives him so much more pleasure, and he will continue to provide and take care of me. Man, like I said, I, I'm first to admit that it is hard. Um, people don't understand it, right? It's very anti-cultural to do those type of things and to add rest into your life and to prioritize God above other things. But I'm coming to find that those moments are becoming so necessary in my life that I would never give it up. There's moments that I gotta get up earlier for other things, and so I just set my alarm even earlier to get up and still have that time I have with God to make sure that we're prioritizing that time with our family because I need it in my life. And it makes everything else in my life seem to go so much smoother. Because right? Jesus said, where your treasure is, the desires of your heart will also be. And so when you consider where you treasure in, in regards to time, is it lining up with your heart? Right? If not, make some adjustments. And the more you start treasuring the correct things, the more your heart will desire those moments. 
And the more you desire those moments, the more you're going to treasure that time. And you will make that time happen. All right? How many of you guys just, you know, you miss church even for a week and you're like, man, that was a rough week. I just need to get back to my church family. Right now, imagine like you're spending that same adequate time with God every day, what your life would look like. But Jesus was talking more than just about time that we treasure. He was specifically talking about physical possessions. I mean, the second place to look at where you do to, to look at and evaluate your priorities is your bank account, right? You will spend money on the things that you treasure, the things that you value, right? If you put all of your spending into a pie graph of all of your values, where would be the biggest slices, right? For most people, if you bundled their home and their bills and all of those things that are around the home, and you categorize them under family because you're pro- providing for your family, it's probably one of the biggest slices. You probably have other categories such as, you know, uh, hobbies and retirement and savings and paying off debt and, and all those different categories in your life. But I want you to consider how big is your God slice, right? Is it let match up to your values? Giving to Big C Church, not just this church, but all the things that God has asked us to do with our possessions, Are we taking care of the poor around us? Are we supporting missionaries? Are we taking care of other church members, the widows, the orphans? Right, Because Jesus, following that verse about where your your treasure is, your heart and your desires will be also, verse 24 of Matthew 6, Jesus says, No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. See, in America, especially in first world countries in general, we've been taught and we lived in a way that that money is our master, right? And you may not believe me, but just listen to this, right? You go to school as a young age primarily to be educated to take a job. And then that job will then begin to direct and dictate the rest of your life, right? It it determines in our, our society the value of life that you will live. Right? The quality of life you will live, or the class that you will fit into, the people you will be around. All of that is determined by money from the very beginning of your life to leading you to where it is. Right? We buy things directly corresponding to the amount of money that we have or reality that we hope to have someday. Right? We direct and build our lives around our work schedules and the money we make. Right? We don't take vacations. We don't take rest. Because we have to have this income. Right? We work to pay the bills for things we decided that we will need. Right? We even miss out on church events and things that God has for us, family events. And other things that people would deem in their life more important than money, for money. Because right? nobody in here, if I said money is the most important thing in your life, would raise their hand. Right? No, like, you're like, I don't, I don't believe that. And I believe you. I believe that your heart says No. Money is not the most important thing to me. And that's why Jesus said enslaved to money, because no one in slavery does it by option. Right? We are enslaved to money. We let it master us. And we let it master us in a couple different ways. Right? First, we're enslaved to our debt. Right? I saw this quote while researching for this uh, message. It says, the famed Patrick Henry proclaimed, give me liberty or give me death at America's founding. But as our country emerges post-COVID, Americans' motto has changed to, forget financial liberty, give me debt, um, which is just crazy. Like that, this, this quote, did you know that credit card debt just hit an all-time high of over $1 trillion? Trillion, the, the science, like studies show that trillion is a number our brains can't even comprehend. Because like the, the, the amount of money that is, is, is just some astronomical amount. It, it fit a little bit easier in Iowa to explain to people because there's a little bit less people there and uh, things are a little bit more affordable. But, um, so this won't mean as much to you. And I was trying to find a way to calculate it to California, but it, it doesn't scale quite the same. But a trillion dollars buys every person in Iowa, uh, like a brand new house, two cars, and would still have money left over to give them retirement. Now you're like, Iowa only has like 10 people, and they're like <laughs> tractors. So that's what I'm saying. It doesn't mean as much to you. But, I, you know, somehow corresponds to L.A. County. Everybody in L.A. County would have all of their debt paid off, a house, 
brand new cars and still have money for retirement with $1 trillion. And that's the amount of debt our nation has. Right, just in credit card. The average household has $10,000 in credit card debts. American, Americans have all different types of debt, right? We have mortgages, auto loans, student loans, just personal loans. To that, the average household has over $100,000 in debt. And if you remove housing, because some people are like, that's good debt, has a different category. Um, on average, people still have around $40,000 in debt. Right? The total U.S. consumer debt is almost $14 trillion. That is enough money to buy everybody in California a house and still have money left over. We have become a slave to needing money. And so therefore, money becomes our master. Proverbs 22, 7 says, just as the rich rule the poor, so the borrower is servant to the lender. Right? Or another translation says, the lender is master of the borrower. Wait, does your bank account reflect someone who's building up treasures in heaven or someone who's building up treasures on earth? Right? I want you to know today I'm not asking for your money. Some of you guys are probably already checked out. You're like, a church talk about money again. Cool. <laughs> right? It hits home, right? If you have attended here for any amount of time, you will notice we don't even pass an offering plate. We don't even ask for offerings. Because that's not who we are. And so I want you to hear me today that this isn't from a place of I need your money. That we need your money. I don't need your money. God does not need your money. He provides for this place. And it's his job. And we're going to talk about how it's his job to provide for your life. It's not even your job to provide for yourself. Right? I'm not worried about money because God will provide. Right? And so this message is not about giving me money. And I'm even going to challenge you on that, that if you hear this message and you're convicted and you're like, I want to test God in this, but I don't want to give to that guy up there asking for my money, go give it to someone else. Find another church across town. Find another ministry to support because I don't want you to miss out on God's plan for your life because you think I want your money, right? I'm here because my job is to tell you what's in the word. My job is to teach you what Jesus said, right? And so that you can do your best to live a life that matches up to his, right? And so please tune back in, you know, you can hear the word money, keep, stop like turning off your hearing aids, uh, because Jesus talked about this. Right? This is one third of his Sermon on the Mount is about possessions. Right? And so it's important. It was important to the world back then to understand this, it's even more important to the world we have today. Right? I want to show you what Jesus had to say about money so that we can be people that reflect Jesus in every aspect of our life. A few years ago, I worked for a financial advisor company. Um, you know, I went around meeting with different families and helping them readjust their uh, financial portfolio of their life, helping them get set up for retirement and get out of debt and make sure they were properly covered in their lives with different things. And so I, I got to find out a lot about people's relationship with money, what people really valued, what things really lined up with people. And what I found is that most people's financial life doesn't have much of a finance plan of any sort. Um, and they really let money master them in the fact that they, they're afraid of doing something to it. We would meet with families that had astronomical debt and you know, no retirement or savings in place. And so anything happening was just going to send their world into chaos. And uh, what was crazier than all of that, though, is that we would put together a financial plan that would, wouldn't cost them any money. It was just rearranging what they already had and, and it would you know, help them to build up a savings and do all these things and most people turned it down because like, you just don't touch people's money. People don't even want to talk about money. Right? How many of you in here, if I just like, let's go through all the numbers and talk about how much you make or how much debt you have. No, you, people are already shaking their head. Like, like, no, you don't talk about that stuff. Right? Like money is this thing that we let control us. Right? Whether you like it or not, whether you think it does or it doesn't, it has affected your life and it is controlling actions that you do. Don't let your money master you. Right? If you don't at least have a basic plan for your finances, 
and you feel like you have to live to serve your money, then you need to reevaluate your money situation. Right? Finances are one of the most stressful topics in the U.S. Right? Not only is it you know, government debates for endless years and decades, but personally, it's one of the main reasons for relationships not working, people getting divorced. It leads to suicides. Right? It's one of the, like, the leading cause of stress-induced health issues in our nation. And when you let anxiety and worry about your finances run your life, it's another way that it masters you. Right? This is what Jesus goes on to talk about after he's saying, don't be enslaved to your money. Matthew 6, verse 25, he goes on to say, that is why I tell you to not worry about your everyday life. Whether you have enough food or drink or enough clothes to wear, is it life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will bring its own worries for trouble is, today's trouble is enough for today. Anyone like that last line hits really good, today's trouble is enough for today. Uh, anyone else just like maybe a little bit convicted after reading that? We spend so much time worrying about money and about provisions. Jesus said, these worries dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. If you call yourself a Christian, if you really live that and want to live that, you would not worry about money. You would seek God's kingdom first and live righteously, which means with great faith. And he will take care of all that you need. One of the third ways that money masters us is if we put our trust in our money. If your trust is in your savings account or your retirement or the, your job that you have, it is mastering you. Do you know why they had printed on money in God we trust? Right? It wasn't this like reminder for the, just the nation about the nation being built on God, but it was a reminder that this money is not where you're supposed to place your trust. Right, that's literally what they thought. They're like, we need, we're going to print this money and it's going to make you know, the economic run smoother because it's, like, it's really hard to travel with chickens to trade for butter. You know? It's like, you know, if I could just sell this chicken and get this cash, I could use that cash to buy the things that I need. But people, they were worried people will start putting their trust in building up stacks of cash. And it's not in the cash that we trust. It is in God who is our provider. If you're, you know, money is not your provider. It's not a guarantee. It's not a constant in your life. If your worries lead you to believe that if you had a little bit more money, things would be okay, then you're letting money master you. Jesus said, don't even worry about tomorrow. Right? And again, I'm not here because I'm perfect at this by any means. I'm here because I've personally working on this in my life just the same as all of us. I grew up in the same world. I, I've gone through the same experiences. And we are working to get this priority and value correct in our lives as well. Um, five years ago, Vic and I made a lot of major changes in our life to reflect this. We've never really made a ton of money, but God has really greatly blessed us. He's taken care of our needs. And I mean, I have story after story after story of God's provision in our life. But... Um, you know, I, 2016 or so, um, I just kind of caught up in, like, trying to chase some worldly dreams in my life, and we bought what was, to us, a very expensive house. Um, it was definitely a God thing, and I think that God gave it to us in somewhat of a necessity, but also because we kept asking for it, and sometimes God's like, 
right, you keep asking, here you go. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll learn a lesson from it instead. But uh, we liked having things, as most people do. We, got, we had a four-bedroom, two-bath house, and uh, we filled it with all the stuff we thought we needed. Right, we built a home recording studio. We had a three-car garage, and I had three cars to fit in that garage. And, um, you know, I was looking for more because I was always into projects. I had a project car that I spent a lot of time and money working on. Um, we had all the toys we thought we needed for our kids, more than enough clothes for all of us. But the reality is we weren't happy, you know, and most of you guys have experienced that at some point in your life. I didn't take care of my worries. Um, I was actually stressed because I had to work more hours and take side jobs to be able to continue to pay for all the things that I had accumulated. Um, Vic was stressed with trying to keep the house clean and take care of all the things that we thought we needed and to have in the home. And it was just a lot. And we got to a spot where we really couldn't afford the life that we were trying to live and, you know, slowly going into more debt instead of getting more financially healthy. And uh, the comedic thing about all of this is this happened after I worked as a financial advisor, you know? So, <laughs> but, you know, that's kind of all of us, right? Nobody takes their own advice. Um, but I, I remember working on a sermon. We were doing a sermon series at our church where we went um, each week. We, we picked something about, out of the next book of the Bible. And um, so I was reading through the Bible to, you know, prepare my messages, and I was in the book of Haggai, and in chapter 1, verses 3 through 9, I read this, and I was really convicted about what I was doing in my life, and it says, then the Lord sent this message to the prophet Haggai, why are you living in luxurious houses while my house lies in ruins? This is what the Lord of heaven's army says, look at what's happening to you. You have planted much, but you harvest little. You eat, but you're not satisfied. You drink, but you are still thirsty. You put on clothes, but you cannot keep warm. And your wages disappear as though you're putting them in pockets filled with holes. Does that sound familiar to anybody like, at a time in your life? Right? It says, this is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. Look at what's happening to you. Now go up into the hills and bring down the timber and rebuild my house. Then I will take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You hoped for rich harvests, but they were poor. And when you brought your harvest home, I blew it away. Why? Because my house lies in ruins, says the Lord of Heaven's armies, while all of you are busy building your own fine houses. You know, and, and in the book of Haggai, they're like, oh man, you're right. And they, they change what they're doing and they um, start building God's temple and putting things together for, for that. And God all of a sudden miraculously shows up and, and starts providing in all these amazing ways for his people. And man, that sounded a lot like what I was going through. No matter how hard I worked, it never seemed like I had enough. And I felt God tell me, stop trying to build your house. It's not your job. Your job, your place, your position on earth is to build my kingdom. And I'm taking care of the rest. So that's what Jesus said in Matthew 6, Seek the kingdom first, and I will take care of the rest. Little did we know at that time, by the end of that year, we'd be leaving that job with no job lined up. We sold our house. We broke even on, which was a miracle in itself at the time. We saw God provide for our, our needs in miraculous ways over the next year or two as we focus on treasuring God first and paying off debt and not letting money master us. God literally took care of every worry in endless, miraculous ways. And through all of that, though, we, we continued to be givers to the people around us. We didn't stop tithing. We, we, we took care of our friends. They were in need and believed that God would care for us, and he did. And was, the crazy thing is, like, throughout that, God freed us to do more ministry than we ever had in our life. It's been the most freeing. It's been one of the most joyful journeys in our life. We, I mean, we even lived in a, a camper for a few months. Um, like, I, I mean, it's crazy, this story, but... God continued to just line things up to provide a home for us that just looked different, like multiple, multiple different ways through that time. And I believe God taking care of us miraculously because we were just honoring him the best we could with what we had. And so when you consider that pie chart of your finances, what does your God slice look like? Right? God doesn't want us to be oblivious to our finances or to be dumb about them. He just wants them to reflect his kingdom, right? And that means finances should be a material that paves the way for the work that he has for us, right? Not the carrot we're chasing or the defining value of our life. God will honor us when we seek his kingdom first and we focus on building up his kingdom over our own. 
So if we aren't supposed to serve money, and we're not supposed to let it, you know, like we're not supposed to build up these treasures on earth, why does God then bless us with possessions and jobs and, and those types of provision? Well, first off, we have to remember that everything that is given to us is God's still. It's not fully ours. We're just stewards of God's things. And we should use it in a way that honors him. Right? That's what he's looking for. Steward, stewardship is a really interesting word because in, uh, in English today it talks about like just you know, properly handling time and money, when you're being a good steward. But a, a steward in the Greek back in the biblical times was an actual position. Like you would hire someone to be the steward of your household, especially like if the, the wealthier people. And their job was to manage all of your household affairs and make sure that they lined up with your priorities. Right? And so it, it's, it's beyond just a, a thing you do. It's, it's a, a being that God has asked us to be is a steward of his things. Right? All of creation, the world and everything in it, is God's property, and he's called us to steward his house here on earth. Though it's not ours, he's invited us to look after it and enjoy it. Right? So first, we're given things to take care of his church. Right? It's not just this building, but the people inside of it, the people that go to other churches, the people that are out spreading the gospel all around the world. We are given to, to give to them and be a blessing to them. Right? All the way back in the, the early you know, uh, Bible times, God put a thing in place called tithe, giving 10% of everything that they made um, so that God could provide for the priests in the temple and provide food for those who are in need around them, the widows and the orphans, right? He, he put in place this thing to care for everybody in their community. Do you know that not too long ago, even in America, the church was responsible for taking care of the less fortunate around us? It was the church's job. But because churches no longer had the money, that responsibility was pushed upon the government. And it's kind of a mess. Right? But it's because we didn't hold up our end of what God asked us to do. It's still our responsibility. Right? I mean, we already kind of talked about this, but here's the deal. People really, really dislike, probably hate being told to give. Right? right? Just being told what to do with their money in general but even more so when it means giving to the church. And I church. No churches have had a bad rap at spending or asking for money. You know, thanks to all the televangelists out there. But uh, I want to tell you today that if you give at least $100 today, your blessing will be in the mail. No, uh, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> um, now, what I really want to tell you is that as a church, we, are, we promise to do our best that, that the money that comes in is spent in a biblical, valued way, focused on the purpose that God gave our church that, to gather, to grow, and to go, right? And so that means that we are focused on this gathering, like uh, having a place that we can gather and using this space that we have as a place for people to continue to gather, right? But we also mean that we're going to use some of those things for us to grow more like Jesus, whether it's through resources or classes or opportunities for people to have that ability to learn more about who Jesus is, Right? And maybe that means staffing people who can then come and continue to help teach and lead us into a life that looks like Jesus. But it also means that we're spending money to go and serve our community, right? to take care of the needs of the people outside of these walls, because that is a call that the church has been called to do. Right? And we believe that if we are building God's kingdom, that he will continue to provide for us, right? just as we should individually believe that as well. Right? Another way that that is said um, by Paul in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 7, he says, remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. Right? Other versions of this verse say you reap what you sow. In other words, you will get out of it what you put into it. Right? If you want your life to succeed in God's kingdom, be a giver. Right? Not just of money, but of time, of everything. Right? Storing up wealth, putting your security in money does not get rid of worrying. Right? That's why he's, what Jesus was talking about, moths will still bust in, thieves can still steal it. Right? Like I have some money in the crypto world right now. I mean, I had money in the crypto world right now. You know, uh, like, you don't know what's going to happen. It's not a promise, it's not a guarantee, but God's promise always stands firm. 
That's what he means by build up your treasures in heaven where nothing can steal it and take it. It's not just like when I get to heaven, I'm going to have this beautiful mansion of things. What God is saying is you take care of my things there on earth and I will continue to take care of you because your treasures are in a place that nobody can take it. I met uh, this man from Korea who invented aloe vera water. Have you guys heard of aloe vera water? It's water with chunks in it. It's very weird. Uh, um, but uh, he, he was the first person to come up with aloe vera water. And uh, he told God, God, if, if you help me to succeed, I will live off of only 20%, and I will give 80% of this away. And so from the very, very beginnings of his first little business, he started giving away 80%. And now he's, you know, he's, his company is huge, and he still gives away 80%. You know what he does with that money? Is he funds missionaries to the Middle East. He funds houses of prayer in the Middle East. And I got to meet him. When we had been there, we went to plant houses of prayer. And uh, on the way out, we were stopped in Dubai, and he heard of what we had done, and he flew all the way to take us out to dinner on his own dime out of his 20%. Because he's a giver, and God has continued to bless that man who, who gives above and beyond anything that God had close to asked out of us. We are blessed to be a blessing. You will reap what you sow. Right? And like I said earlier, if you want to test this theory of giving, you don't have to give here. Because, right? I, again, I'm not here to ask for your money. I'm here to show you what Jesus wants to do. Right? And I know, I, I know, we know that when you give, God takes care of you. And there's many people in here who can share those stories, have shared it with us, where God has come through in miraculous ways. I think of just, like, one moment in our lives where, uh, when Vic and I were, uh, I don't know, first married, she um, broke my mouth. And... Um, and, uh, I mean, I deserve that hit, but, uh, no, just kidding. <laughs> uh, I don't, yeah. No, I'm just going to leave it at that. No, uh, so have you ever seen, like, when someone yawns and you shove your finger in their mouth to ruin their yawn? Um, well, so I was yawning, she shoved her finger in her mouth, so I bit down on her finger. So then she jammed her finger into the roof of my mouth. And, uh, you know, because that's what you do when you're young and in love. And, uh, but... In reality, it actually turned out to be kind of a miracle because I had this infection in my, like, between my sinus cavity and the roof of my mouth that had been happening for years, but it was just in an unnoticed space, so it was, nothing was happening. But when she jammed the roof of my mouth, it broke through the little bit of bone that was left there, and my roof of my mouth swelled up really bad. And I was like, what did you do to me? And, uh, but we had no money. Like, we were poorer than poor, and I, we, we didn't have health insurance. We didn't have anything. And uh, a, a new dentist office had opened up in town, and they were doing, like, your first exam is free. And I'm like, well, I better go see what they, they can do about this. And so I go in there, and they're like, yeah, your first exam is free, but what you have is expensive. And uh, I, remember, I don't remember the number, but I remember it was thousands upon thousands, I don't know, 12 grand or something. It was like the start, like to do the first step of this thing to try and resolve what's going on. And it was like, I have no money, like nothing, no opportunity. And um, so we're praying God we provide. And through this, we had actually decided for our first, I don't know, year of marriage or two years, like we wanted our life to be foundationally set on God. And we decided that we were going to tithe 20%. And um, of our income, which was not very much money. She worked at Starbucks, and I drove school bus. And, um, but we were like, God, we want our life to be set correctly. And so that's what, I mean, we were giving to God, and we were like, God, you have to come through. Like, we have no other option. I do not have insurance. I have blessed assurance. And, uh, and I, but I just started praying to God, like, what are you going to do about this? And in the middle of the school year, which never, had, in all of the years I've worked anywhere, they opened up. Um, health insurance enrollment. And um, so I signed up for dental because it was the only thing we could afford, just that piece. Um, actually, I think I, I had an eye vision because I needed glasses and I hadn't gotten glasses for like, I don't know, my life. And uh, we, uh, so it was like $30 a, a paycheck or something. And um, I'm like, well, I have, I have insurance. Okay, let's go in, you know, go, go in to look into this thing. Oh, no, no, it was even crazier. So before that happened, a hailstorm came through. And uh, put, like, maybe two dents in my car. And I, like, um, didn't, didn't even, like, get to take it to insurance because I was like, there's no damage here. And uh, my dad was like, you should really take it through just have them look at it. And they found some bajillion dollars. I'm sure they thought they were going to make a lot of money off me or something. And uh, but I ended up getting a check for, like, six grand. 
um, from our car insurance for like two dents of hail that I could see. And I was, I was like, wow, we, we're, we're like partway there. We're going to make it. And then literally show up to work the next day and they open and roll for uh, health insurance stuff in the middle of the year. I ended up going to there and all of it was covered. I think we paid like $50. Um, Man, and like, I don't know, that's just one of hundreds of stories I could tell of just like God showing up in miraculous ways. And it, it's, it's a promise. It's not even just like, a, well, you know, I'll decide whether I'm going to take care of you or not. It's a promise that that is what he will do. Right? There's, there's another lie that goes around that like, Jesus doesn't support tithing in the New Testament. And um, I don't really get to spend a whole lot of time there, but Matthew 23, 23 Jesus says, you should tithe. Yes, okay, it's there, it's in the verse. Um, and again, this isn't, this verse he actually says, what sorrow awaits you teachers, you religious of the religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, right? But you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice and mercy and faith. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. Right? God expects us to give, but that, that is not what he's wanting out of us. Right? Like he said in the verse, there's more important things than giving your exact 10% of everything you have. Right? God doesn't want your money more than he wants you to live for him. Right? God wants you to live for him, therefore he wants you to be a wise steward of your money. That's what that verse is saying. Right? Be reminded that it's not ours to begin with. Right? When we understand that, it makes us take this so much more seriously. Right, if someone gave you their money, right, access to their bank account to provide for your life, right, you'd be really cautious with how you spend it. Right, because you want to honor that person for what they've done for you. Right, and so when you think of that, like what I have is because God's given it to me, it makes me be more cautious with how I'm spending it. Right? You may be upset that God has asked for 10% of what he's given you, but really he asked for all of it. Right? Jesus is the example for us. He laid down his whole life. Right? What if Jesus like, I'm only going to crucify 10% of me? Thank you. Oh, that's hilarious. Um, <laughs> right? You're only 10% saved now. Um, Jesus asked for 100% of everything that we have because it's all given to us in the first place that we'd be just willing to say, God, it's yours first and foremost. Like that's how we prioritize it. Right? But we're given to take care of people around us. Matthew 6, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he actually starts off the chapter like this. He says, watch out. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others for you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. When you give to someone in need, don't do it as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues, in the streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth, they have received all the reward they will ever get. But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand see what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private and your father who sees everything will reward you. What I love about this is when Jesus set out this example here, he didn't even have to start with, you must give, right? He knew that these people want to be followers of him, that there are already people who understand scripture, and he knew that they were already givers. That's that's the level that Jesus expects us to live at, that we are already givers, and all he needs to do is give us some instructions on how to give. Right, And this came right after the same sermon where he said, don't just take care of those that you love, take care of those you would consider your enemies in Matthew 5. Right? This is what the first church did in, in the, the book of Acts. It says that they, they sold their properties and they gave away their possessions to take care of the needs around them. Acts 4, 34 through 35 says, There were no needy people among them, but those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. Right? And sometimes we think this is only for people who have an abundance. Right? But this is the calling for everyone. Jesus pointed out this, uh, this widow who gave, it says like, basically like, two pennies dropped in the offering and said, she's given more than the people who dropped off thousands of dollars because she gave out of, like, the, not the abundance, out of what was a necessity for her life. John, 1 John 3, 16 through 18 says, we know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our life for our brothers and sisters. 
If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need, but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. Right? I'm not here today to pressure you to give. It's my responsibility to teach you the word. That's what you brought me here for. And just like that verse we read just a few moments ago, each of you have to decide in your heart what to give and give with a cheerful heart. Right? God looks at our heart. He knows our intentions. Right? In 1 Samuel, I think 16, he's looking at Dave, you know, trying to find a king. He says that, that God looks at the heart. He knows what's the intentions inside of it. If you're going to give because you just feel pressured to, then that's not what God is asking for. God wants you to give cheerfully to his kingdom, to build the, his house, and to be glad and just be able to let go of all of your worries about money. And again, that's not even giving to the church. Give to the person in need on your street. If your neighbor is hurting, give to them. Buy the person who was in front of you with groceries that couldn't afford to buy it all. Pay for the rest of their groceries. Right? Those type of things is what God is asking us to do. But also Jesus wanted to make it known that God is in control. That was the point of this message. Right? He's the provider, not us. Not our jobs, not our savings. Only he knows the hours that we have left in life. And he's the only one who can give more or less. So choose the right master to serve with your life. The one that actually provides security. Because right? this is what Jesus was doing through his message, is reestablishing who God is. Right? This is what kind of king our Father in heaven is in this new kingdom. And it's who he's always been. When we look at the Old Testament, in Psalm 41, 1 through 3, it says, Oh, the joys of those who are kind to the poor. The Lord rescues them when they are in trouble. The Lord protects them and keeps them alive. He gives them prosperity in their land, and he rescues them from their enemies. And the Lord nurses them when they are sick and restores them to health. Proverbs eleven twenty four through 25, it says, Give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. Right? Those are like countercultural to the world we live in. Hey, be generous. The generous will prosper. And those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. Proverbs 19, 17 says, If you help the poor, you are lending to the Lord, and he will repay you. Proverbs 21, 13 said, Those who shut their ears to the cries of the poor will be ignored in their own time of need. Proverbs 22, 9 says, Blessed are those who are generous, those who are generous because they feed the poor. Blessed. Right? The challenge today is for the rest of this year, I mean, hopefully the rest of your life, that you just be more generous. Be cheerful givers who go above and beyond, not just of your money, but of your time and your things. Right? If you're like, I don't, I don't even know where to start. You know, the number in the Bible is 10%. If you can't do 10%, start somewhere. Again, Jesus says it's, it's about the heart. It's about starting and getting moving forward with that. Maybe you're like, I've always been a tither, but I don't realize I was doing it from the right place. Maybe you need to make adjustments in the rest of your finances or your time or your calendar. And then sit back and stop worrying and watch God do what he said he was going to do. Let's pray. God, I thank you that, that your promises hold true above and beyond everything else in this world around us. God, I love that your kingdom is so backwards to the world that we live in, but sometimes that's really hard for us to understand and to, to make those adjustments in our life. God, and I pray today you would help us to, to stop making excuses and start making adjustments. God, that if we really treasure you, that our lives would reflect that, that people would see that, that they'd be able to look at our lives and say, you really do treasure God. God, that our heart would desire you in those same ways. God, I pray that you would just help us to, to make those decisions. God, that you would give us wisdom, that you would give us direction in the adjustments we need to make in our calendars and, and with the things that we own, Lord. God, and beyond all that, thank you for being so good to us, God. That even when we haven't always sought your kingdom first, you've still provided. You still care for us. I thank you for the picture of the world around us and the, the animals that, that don't worry about need. 
and you still provide for them. God, I pray that you would right now just come, you would bring peace to these people, that you would wipe, wipe out the, the worry and the anxiety of how they're going to provide for their lives, and that you let them see that that's on you. It's not on us to carry. God, and would you just, would we just have story after story of your miraculous, your miraculous provision in our life, Lord? That we'll be free to share about it. That we wouldn't let money master us anymore. But God, that we would choose to just be a follower of you. In your name we pray, amen. All right, so go and get your treasures in order so that you're serving the right master.